What does it look like to create the room for God to do whatever He wants before He does whatever He wants? Do everything you can to anticipate. What does it look like if God were to bring the increase you've asked for? Everybody in this room has areas of fruitfulness and every one of us have areas of barrenness. Every one of us have things that just, they haven't worked like we've prayed, like we've planned, like we've anticipated. We have great testimonies, we have extraordinary things that God has done, but we all have experiences in barrenness as well. And here he's, he's, he's saying, shout for joy, and then he says cry aloud. That word cry is actually the word scream. So we're talking about deliberate, extreme expressions of joy. It's not a scream of pain or fear or terror. It's a scream of anticipation. <laughs> now, how many believe this is true? All right, all right. So this is what it says. It says, shout for joy while you can't have kids. Face the thing that you have the least breakthrough in, the most barren area. It may be the salvation of your family members. It may be a health condition. It may be you lose job after job after job. It could be any number of things, but there it is right in front of you. And the instruction in Scripture is to shout with extreme celebration before the answer comes. Now, some would say, well, that's not reasonable. It isn't reasonable from human perspective. It's totally logical and intellectual from God's perspective. It's the intelligent response when you see the promise and the eyes of the promise giver. The one who has never lied the one who has no respect of persons, the one who's the same yesterday, today, and forever. When you see that, then it's the perfectly intelligent thing to do. Because for, from the one who gave you the promise, he lives in eternity, and in his sight, it is already completed. So when he gives us a promise, he goes into our future, and he brings back the word that is necessary to get us where he saw us. So he brings us the word that actually enables us to enter the very realm that he intends for us. So it's the intelligent thing to do, to get happy before you need to. You know, it's, it's, go ahead, that's all right. I like it. I like it. So he says, all right, don't just give emotional expression. I believe emotional expression is vital. In fact, in this case, the emotional expression is the clearest evidence of faith in this chapter. To try to do the Christian life without emotion and emotional involvement, if emotional expression, is to void the nature of the gospel. Because the kingdom of God is righteousness, peace, and joy. Two of those are felt realities. Now, it's true that throughout history, there have been those who have, em have embraced personal experience above Scripture and have ended up denying Scripture. That is obviously a danger. It's equally dangerous to approach the scripture on an intellectual basis and to have no personal emotional involvement or relationship. When I got married to my wonderful wife, I did not get married so that I could have uh, a marriage license. <laughs> I, believe it or not, I didn't get married so that the state of California would consider me a married individual. I got married because I was partnering with someone for a lifelong journey together, relationally, before God. That was my purpose. When we came to Christ, it was not to have fire insurance to escape hell. <laughs> it was an ongoing relationship with our maker, who according to the scripture, becomes our husband that makes fruitfulness in our area of greatest barrenness even possible. 
You may not like the illustration, but he's, he's trying to show you, listen, this is how near I am to you. I become one with you so that you become fruitful in your area of greatest barrenness. And because of that, you have reason to joy. So he says, not only should there be emotional response before you see the answer, he says, lengthen your cords, strengthen your pegs. What he's saying is, he listen, if you want a, a child and you have um, a one-bedroom home, add a, add a bedroom. <laughs> add a bedroom before you're pregnant. You need to create the room for God to fill it. There's a great story of uh, Jack Coe. I tried to find it this morning, I, I couldn't, but it, it goes something like this. He was gonna pray for, he's one of the great healing revivalists of back in the 50s. In fact, his son, Jack Coe Jr., is a personal friend, just talked with him again this week. Uh, but his, his, uh, there's a story about Jack Coe. He was going to pray for, I think it was five people in wheelchairs, so he had set up this appointment to meet with them. And when he walked into the room, he noticed that none of them brought shoes. And so he said, come back tomorrow and I'll pray for you but bring shoes. And so the next day he prayed for them and all five got out of the wheelchair and had shoes to walk with. The point was, is you have to, you have to anticipate what's about to happen and be, re be ready, add the room on, add the room. What, what would it look like? See, a lot of people actually don't have time for revival because we, we've filled our life without God. What does it look like to create the room for God to do whatever he wants before he does whatever he wants? So he says, stretch out the curtains of your dwelling. That's it. They lived in tents. So he's just describing what it is to add the room before the child comes. Do everything you can to anticipate. What does it look like if God were to bring the increase you've asked for? Some of you have received uh, unusual promises from the Lord about prosperity, about increase. Don't wait till it comes to figure out what to do. Get your values intact now. Get your values intact now. It may seem like a strange illustration to you, but Judas hung himself. There were 11 apostles. There were supposed to be 12. So they appointed a 12th one at the end of chapter one of Acts, at the beginning of chapter two in, in Acts, the outpouring of the Spirit came. In other words, they got the wineskin ready and then the wine came. Get the context prepared for what God's about to do. Make deliberate choices. Demonstrate there's genuine faith there. Make deliberate choices to get ready. Two things are mentioned as our inheritance in this chapter. The first one that I'll mention is verse 17. The ability to condemn the voices of darkness that oppose us. That's part of our inheritance. But the other part of our inheritance is in verse 3. It says, you'll expand to the right and to the left. Your descendants will inherit nations and, and, and make uh, desolate cities inhabited. Have you ever, has anyone ever looked on, on, online to see some of the pictures uh, in China that have anticipated great growth in certain areas of their nation and they've built entire cities, skyscrapers, everything, and there's hardly anybody living in them. It's a weird thing to see. So, I mean, they're brand new, houses are built, the high rises are built, and there's just hardly anybody there. The, the Lord is saying, that's what I'm gonna fill but I'm gonna to give to the people who are joyful. I'm gonna to give it to those who know how to express faith through their emotion. They anticipate before they see any sign of breakthrough, they already are anticipating, preparing their ground. It's those people I'm going to give the nations to and I'm gonna let them fill the desolate cities. 